Hello. We're going to go ahead and get started this evening. My name is Kendall Bick. I'm the chairman of the Eastern Iron Grazing Council. And on behalf of the council myself, I would like to, to welcome each and every one of you to the March uh, workshop this evening. You guys loving the sunshine out there? What? Yeah. You guys liking the sunshine? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, the snow sure has been uh, hanging on. So, before we get into uh, this evening's program, I would like to recognize three of our sponsors that we have with us this evening. When I call the sponsor's uh, name, would you please come up and receive your plaque and tell us a little bit about your business. So the first one we'd like to recognize this evening is uh, Farm Credit. And here on behalf of Farm Credit is Dan Biller. Dan, on behalf of the Grazing Council, I'd like to present to you this sponsorship plaque. Please uh, display that in, in your business proudly. We certainly appreciate those dollars that you provide us with, and also the napkins and the paper goods. So thank you very much. It's great to have the opportunity to support a good uh, grassroots organization, uh, and, and that's really what you are, because we work towards raising grass and, and uh, how we try to sustain agriculture. So keep up the good work. Um, as far as farm credit goes, uh, we're an agriculture lender. Um, we finance operating livestock purchases, real estate improvements and real estate, also uh, equipment. Um, and if you do business at places like D&J, they also offer Ag Direct, which is a form of farm credit financing. So, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. And um, so, if you have questions, we also do leases on equipment and uh, some pole buildings uh, uh, and things like that when, when it's right for you. And then we offer crop insurance, uh, pasture insurance, and those kinds of things. So, if you have questions, Feel free to give us a call and we'll see if we can help you out. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Farm Credit has been a sponsor of the East Mount Grayson Council for quite a few years now, so it's nice to have them continue on. We really appreciate that. The next business I'd like to recognize as a sponsor, this is their second year, and it's the D&J Sales and Service. Representing them is John Jones. John, on, on behalf of the Eastern Iron Grazing Council, we certainly uh, appreciate your sponsorship dollars and present you with this plaque uh, please uh, display it in your business proudly. Thank you. We will. There you go. I'll read that. There you go. <laughs> uh, thanks to you guys. Like I said, it's one of those things at D&J. You know, it's kind of funny. I come here. I've got a lot of customers, neighbors here. There's probably more people here that I know that I don't. Um, but like I said, uh, we're a farm equipment dealership, if most of you don't know, uh, in Harrison County. We uh, sell McCormick, Massey, Ferguson tractors, Coyote tractors, Vermeer hay equipment, Crone hay equipment, Massey hay equipment, uh, Bush Hall brand rotary cutters. Um, uh, we're into aero equipped cattle handling equipment, feed train, uh, feeding systems, things like that. So uh, very diverse. Like I said, Carroll County has been a very important part of our business as well as Harrison. You know, we're not just in Harrison County only, we support the fair here and things like that. Um, like I said, our big business, you know, I always say we're in a niche market in our location just because 
we do focus a lot on cattle. You know, when, when the grain market tanks or whatever, you know, we're not into combines and tillies and things like that. So like I said, we got a little bit different market. Like I said, that's because of people like you guys. Like I said, I've got a lot of customers here. Um, you know, and Vermeer's a great partner. We are, we're, we're one of Vermeer's bigger dealers. We're actually their biggest dealer uh, east of Mississippi. So, uh, and Vermeer's a company that really strives about forage, you know. And uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, I'll personally invite all of you that are here tonight. Uh, we're going to have a Vermeer Anderson uh, wrapper night, uh, April the 5th at the Harrison County Fairgrounds. We're going to talk about making baleage. Uh, we'll have you know some presentations from Anderson on how to make baleage. Um, and then Vermeer will also be there. We'll talk about balers and mowers and things like that. And I heard some of you guys talking in line, well, you know, you just made baleage. We sell most of the stuff that we sell now for the baleage is beef guys. You know, the dairy farmers are really struggling. You know, we've had these Anderson and Vermeer nights. This is the first year we've combined them. Um, you know, and whenever we have a wrapper night or whatever, if we got 20 people there, 18 of them are beef people. Uh, so like I said, you know, our, our area here is very beef driven, you know, which goes back to grazing and what you guys do. And like I said, you know, I've got some neighbors here that are really close to me, so I see what happens and how things work there. So again, thanks for the, for the appreciation. We, we, we uh, appreciate you guys. And like I said, we enjoy supporting the community. Like I said, that's one thing we do at our business is we tend to support uh, those who support us. So thank you. John, that event there at the fairgrounds, what, what, what's the time on Six, that? Six thirty. Six thirty. Six thirty. We won't have uh, roast beef, but we'll have wings and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. And that was April 15th? April 5th. April 5th. April 5th. April 5th. Six thirty. Yep. All right. Just, Thank and you. we'll ask you, RSVP, just call the dealership and let us know if you want to come. So we can make sure we have enough pizza and wings. All right. Thanks for the invite. The last business that I would like to recognize this evening for sponsorship is Straight A's, the ranch uh, city there located in Minerva. So, Sean, would you like to come up? Sean, on behalf of the East High Grazing Council, we certainly like to uh, show our appreciation by providing us a sponsorship plaque for your business. Please uh, display it there in your business proudly. Most of y'all know I'm Sean from Straight A's. Uh, you know, we're here to, to help y'all out. We're kind of in the business of uh, rotational grazing supplies, livestock equipment, fencing. Uh, we're also there for advice. Uh, you know, we try to keep ahead of everything that's going on so we can provide our customers with some of that information. Uh, doesn't matter whether you come to, to buy anything or not. You know, we're always there for a good chat. I like to see what everybody else is doing. Um, we were talking here just a little bit ago. Uh, some things work in one operation. Uh, they may or may not work in another operation. So it's always a good idea to, to kind of get some of those different ideas and try what works. You know, if, if it works, fine. Keep doing it. If it doesn't, find something else that does. And I think that's one of the good things about uh, this group is we get to go out and see some of those operations in practice and uh, we can kind of take some of that home and, and try it. So we sure appreciate uh, y'all's patronage and we're there to help you out as much as we can. Thank you. All right, that concludes the recognition of our sponsors that we have here tonight, but I would like to mention that uh, we did pick up three more sponsors in the last month, and that was uh, in instrumental by Bev and, and uh, Bruce Riddle, so uh, they have uh, secured uh, three more sponsors. They are uh, Farm Bureau, uh, Keister Implement, and <coughs> Jefferson County Landmark. Jefferson so, Thank you uh, for doing that, and certainly uh, thank them for coming on board. We'll be recognizing them in uh, the future pasture walks. 
and also the ones that uh, we haven't recognized, we'll be doing that throughout the summer at our pasture walks. Thank you. Our first topic is uh, going to be presented by Sandy Smith. Sandy, would you like to come up? Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, where your feet have been. Biosecurity, barnyard biosecurity. Um, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I think it's something we need to go over because next month we start going to farms and uh, touring different operations. So it's something we need to be conscious about uh, when we go to other farms, so forth. So we all have heard flock health is uh, the key to food safety. It's becoming more important. I don't know if anybody has heard about Wendy's. Uh, they're not going to buy unless you are beef quality assurance um, certified. In the next few months, uh, I've been certified now, and we're going to start some classes to make sure we get producers certified again. It's been a long time. Some of you may have been certified in the past, and that's run out. Um, so we're going to be having some classes around the state uh, to recertify people because, um, well, like I said, Wendy's has said that they're not going to buy cattle that don't come from a certified operation. So... Food safety is the big thing now that everybody is worried about. One thing, because it controls disease, it reduces the risk of drug residues. Uh, it improves health and welfare through increases production and efficiency of animals. Uh, it costs less money to prevent than to treat. We all know that. And it establishes vaccination plans, biosecurity protocols, in emergency preparedness. All of these things go into your uh, health management plan. How many of you have a relationship with your veterinarian? <coughs> Very good. You know who he is, you know who or she, you can call whenever. Um, you know, uh, but sometimes you don't call them for everything. I know my farm down in West Virginia, there's not a veterinarian around that'll work on a sheep. So if we can't take care of it, it's done and planted six feet under. Um, and we do all of our cast own castorating, we do all of our vaccination programs, and our vet knows if we call them, we've got a problem when it comes to the cattle. You know, we, we do everything we can, but that's a good thing. We do have that relationship and they know when we call, we need them. Um, the other thing is develop a herd or flock health plan. Does everybody have that? You know, when your vaccination program and all that. How many of you have a biosecurity plan for your farm? <laughs> What's that? What's that? Yeah. The other part of it is the foreign animal disease and emergency preparedness. Now, if you're raising chickens on a contractor, if you're raising hogs, you know all about this. The companies kind of put these into play for you, and you have to follow it. But everybody should have a biosecurity plan. And farm biosecurity is a set of measures designed to protect the property from the entry and spread of pests diseases, and even weeds. That's what farm biosecurity is. So biosecurity, and this is a short presentation. It's not real long. It's mainly just to, to get you to think more than anything. External biosecurity is keeping diseases out of your herd, off your farm. And internal is keeping those that are already there contained so they don't spread other places. That's just one of the signs that you can buy to put on your farm, asking people to please um, stay on the road, don't go off the road 
come up to the house, let you know they're there before they walk into your barn. So how is disease transmitted when we're talking about biosecurity? Rodents, those wonderful rats and mice that are in the barn this time of year eating the feed. Um, birds, birds carry weed seeds. They also carry uh, this nice bunch here can do, we're all seeing them all over the place now. There's going to be a lot more of them as they start to hatch. Uh, they don't care where they crap. They can spread disease. Avian flu was found in Michigan last year because of one of these nice birds right here. Um, we want to, it can be transmitted between animals uh, of the same species or different species. That's the reason we have to watch with hogs and chickens. They can cross over some diseases. So if you're a commercial or, yeah, raising hogs, um, and Kim's not here tonight, you don't go around the poultry at the fair. There's some things you have to stay away from. Another way is uh, vehicles and equipment. They're not washed and taken care of. New animals coming into your operation can spread. Uh, humans, anybody come in looking like this tonight? Everybody changed clothes before they got here, right? Before you came. How many wore your barn boots to the meeting tonight? Nobody's going to admit it. They did. <laughs> they know I'm after them, huh? No. That's something you have to be very careful of as spreading from one farm to the other. Uh, clothes, shoes, and even the air can transmit diseases and stuff onto your farm. So, external biosecurity, new animals. How many of you clean and disinfect the stalls or whatever that you bring them home to put them into before they come? You should. They need to be in a clean place if you're bringing them home. You know, it's, it's this time of year. How many is going to go out and buy a new bull? We've got bull sales all over. You know, you're bringing them from their place into your place. You need to isolate them for at least 10 days. And that stall should have been disinfected before you put them in. You don't know what they have, and if they're co-mingled like that at a sale. Um, today was one of the big bull sales in West Virginia. Sold over 100 bulls, and they're in pens. They've fed out since October. They're in pens all the way down, probably about 30 bulls to a pen. All these trucks and trailers coming in, all these buyers getting them, walking out through the pens, through the mud and the muck and everything and then loading them up and taking them home. I hope they clean their boots. You know, all those bulls were tested and so forth, but still, it's the co-mingling that you're doing, walking those pens, making sure you get home, you clean your boots really good, and you don't wear them to the barn until they are clean because you can spread disease. Um, you know, this here, last week was the Beef Expo. How many went? Anybody go? A few of you went. You saw animals tied up like this. That's another place, co-mingled. You know, right on the other side is more cattle, nose to nose. They haven't been around each other. Yeah, they've been health tested and should have papers to interstate, but there's always that chance of something breaking out. So we need to just remember when we're buying animals and we're bringing new stuff to the farm, we need to isolate them. And they need a clean place on our place at home, too. You know, you should consult your veterinarian for each situation. Isolate those after you exhibit. Uh, growing up, I showed cattle. My kids showed cattle. We showed cattle in 16 different states. National shows, regional shows, bring them home. We didn't just dump them out with the rest of them. They were kept in the barn, in their pens, and away from the rest, rest of the, the herd. They just didn't get thrown out. A lot of times it wasn't 10 days later they were back at a show again. So it's that 
co-mingling and, and coming in and out traffic that you have to be aware of. And when you're buying new stuff, you definitely want to find out what the vaccination program is. It may not be like yours. They may need something, you know, they may either have more than what you do at home, what your program is at home, or they may have less. And you may need to update them and give them some shots and stuff to keep your health protocol on your farm. Personal, change your clothes, your boots, shoes after visiting other farms, feed stores, livestock shows and auctions every Monday right across the road over here. It's probably <laughs> one of the worst places you can go. Why? Every auction has sick pens, don't they? I mean, we don't always take our best stuff to the sale. We take some of our problems to the sale to get rid of them. They get unloaded the same place as the good stuff that's all healthy. We're driving in. It's not all nice pavement around that barn. It's mud and muck, and you're walking through it, and those animals are walking through it, and diseases can spread, and you can take them home with you. So be aware. Don't wear your barn shoes that you're going to go to the barn in to the livestock auction or at least clean and disinfect them off if you are between. It's very important. Clean and disinfect the scales, show equipment, tools that have been used off the farm. And also, how many of you clean and disinfect your truck and trailer after each use? How many people wash your trailer out after each use? Some? John's shaking his head. Yeah, it's not, it's not bad if you're, you know, you're concentrating and only using that trailer on your animals, hauling them. But when you bring it in here and you co-mingle it with other trailers and you're running the same track, you definitely need to think about washing those tires, washing the underbody of that trailer to keep those diseases out. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to get you to, to think and... and do, do the easy stuff. You know, it's, it's not hard to forget that, uh-oh, you know, I went to the livestock sale and then the truck is filthy. I don't want to drive it out through the pasture. Stop by a car wash or something on the way home? Mm-hmm. And disinfect it with what? Bleach or something? You can use bleach. There's disinfectants. Um, I looked at PB Vest today. They've got anywhere from $25 a gallon disinfectant. You can mix with water to $100, depending on what you, what you want to use. Okay, there is internal. Uh, this is the internal biosecurity. Work with your veterinarian when you have a sick animal. Uh, have separate facilities at home for your sick animals so you're not co-mingling. Um, have clothing, shoes, boots that are only worn to the barn. I teach quality assurance to all the 4-H and FFA kids. I am constantly telling them, you know, it's very easy in the morning when you're late for the bus to run down there, throw the feed in, and jump on the bus with your barn shoes on. Very easy. But when you do that and you go, to, you track all that in school. If you're in FFA class, you're going to track it through the door, and everybody else could get it too. You may have nothing. But you never know what can be transmitted. Keep feed and feed bunks free of manure. And also old, old feed. Get that out of there. Why? Because that can cause a rat and mice problem. It had been a while since I had fed at the sheep barn one year. And so everybody left and I had to do all the feeding. It kind of bothered me when I took the five-gallon bucket of feed and started feeding the ewes, and the rats were jumping in the feeder as soon as I wasn't even 10 feet away. Yeah. I got told the rats were bad. I just didn't know how bad they were. Nobody had done anything. Well, I went to the feed store, and I bought every kind of rat bait they could. I went on the war path because I hate rats. So, yeah, I, I was cleaning house because the dog wasn't helping any either take care of them. 
or there was too many for her, I don't know. The one that tried to crop my leg that she didn't get, I wasn't very happy with her. <laughs> uh, clean water is on a regular basis. You know, keeping them clean, fresh water, that helps prevent sickness. <laughs> Nobody wants to drink dirty, muddy water. You don't, no, your animals don't either. So keeping that hay and stuff out of that, so everything, that's all part of internal biosecurity. This is just a few pictures um, of things you can do. The plastic boots, I priced them today. They're anywhere from $11 to $13 for 25 pairs. Disposable. They do get hot. I agree. You're out there on the farm, you know, but if you're, if we're coming to visit and, and you want to take precautions, that's a way. This here is kind of like a sponge um, that you can clean, clean, uh, clean your feet off. Make sure you have a brush there or whatever if you want to do this type of biosecurity for your farm. Um, get get the, the cake manure or whatever off and then step on. And don't only step on it when you leave. Have it so you step on it when you go in. Um, when we were selling lambs, we had just a, one of those black round tubs, about this high, put about an inch of disinfectant with water mixture in it. When you, you could not step in it. When we were selling lambs and the kids would come, they stepped in through the door, they had to step in it. They stepped in it when they went out. That was, that was the biosecurity measure we did on our farm when we were selling to 4-H and FFA kids. Because they were coming in where we lambed you know, where we were feeding out lambs, so we did that biosecurity. Another thing, whoops, another thing is, you know, if you have rubber boots, just to have in a place where they can brush them off, clean them with water, and a mixture of disinfectant. This is probably extreme, but I used to work in the poultry industry in West Virginia. Actually, I worked for the Department of Agriculture. I was a poultry specialist. The day I interviewed for my job, one of the questions was, do you own poultry and have poultry at home? You have chickens. Back, you know, you get eggs or whatever for your family. I said, no. They said, good. They wanted nobody for that job that had poultry. That way, and the paper I handed out talks about low-risk person. Uh, I could go on poultry farms then and didn't have to worry about you know, me being at home, taking something from home. My brother is a service tech down in West Virginia. He's been for 25 years. He goes out, and he's not a little guy. He's 6'5", and weighs way more than he should right now. But anyway, he's getting older. He has to put boots, coveralls, uh, hairnet when he goes into each different house. And also, when he's no-shave November, he has to put a beard uh, mask on also every time he goes to a different farm he has to stop at the entrance before he goes in suits up before has to do this to his truck tires every time he leaves so that's how serious that the commercial end of it can be we've had even flew down there a couple of times and that's reason you know all the big feed trucks have wash um, tanks on them that have the disinfectant mis mixed right in. So whenever they leave each time a house, they're changing, they're rinsing off to make sure they're not taking from one farm to the other. You can get these signs, whoops, keep pushing the wrong button. You can get these signs, PBS has those also. Just then ask them for people to please stop and check with you before they drive into your farm. Does anybody have any questions? I know we're going to be visiting, so change your clothes. Please wear clean clothes next next month. You know, don't change clothes if you're coming from the barn and rushing to get here. At least make sure that your clothes are clean, no manure on them. Your shoes are clean, no manure, so you're not spreading something to somebody else's. <coughs> and that way, we keep everybody happy and we keep doing this wonderful thing we're doing by visiting different farms and seeing what everybody else is doing. So did you say that we 
quarantine our new bull or cow, cow, calves that we buy um, for 10 days, basically. That's going to give them time to germs to die or what? That's what's going on. 10, 10, days, 10, 10, 10, yeah, 10 to 14 days. days. In the barn, leave them in there. Mm -hmm. And after that time, even what's in your barn is fine. If they have anything, they're going to break out within that, that time period. Okay. But like I said, you should, you know, you should know where you're buying them from, you know, health protocol and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, you should check. Find out what they're, you know, like I said, they may be more than what you do in their vaccination program. They may be less. So you, you definitely want to, if it's less, you know, if they're doing less than what your vaccination is, then you need to catch them up on those shots that, that weren't covered. Because there's other stuff, too, you still for 10 days, whatever. Right. There, the vaccinations aren't going to account for probably. Right. right. You're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, uh, pesticide training this year, we did a thing on ticks. That was the new livestock thing, different ticks. Um, there's a tick, the Gulf Coast tick, that's not in this area yet. It covers completely Florida and so forth, uh, along the coast, Louisiana, all that, right around the coast except it has been found in Oklahoma and Kansas. Why and where? Take a guess. Huh? Cattle. Feedlot cattle. They found it there. So it's just a matter of time. So check your cat. You know, a lot of us, we don't think about that. But people get ticks on them. The dog and the cat gets ticks on them. Cattle can too. So, so pay attention because they can all carry disease. That's how we got Palmer up in Mahoning and Columbiana through um, cotton, cotton seed, feeding the dairy cattle. Yes? What do you do when a pipeline comes through your pasture with uh, 500 different vehicles and 5,000 different people? every day, different crews, and they've been in other farms and they're going to other farms. What do you do about them? They make them wash their browsers off? Or they will not. I tried to get that into my contract. And they turned around and they finally just said, well, if, if we bring any biohazards and security issues onto your farm, we'll correct them. They'll never be able to prove that. Yes. Well, old buddies, SOBs, okay, brought it on. So, I mean, they just foo foo their way. Yep. So you need to do what you can to keep your cattle out of that area while they're doing. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, serious. If you really want to follow this, then you might have to take extra precautions because they're not going to. I ever heard of cattle for sale. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Those boots, Sandy, are they, those one size fits all, or is that? Yeah, pretty much up to size 13 or something. And there's large and extra large. There's three mil and six mil. Um, three mil is good enough, especially, you know, if you're going to use like a disinfectant to step into. You know, we get in the summer, a lot of, some people wear tennis shoes on this, this deal. So if you do do a foot bath, you know, you only need an inch or so of water in there. And they just need to they don't need to step completely down in it, but the whole soul should be wet and, and taken care of. And what, what is the disinfectant? What, what part that product? Um, there's different ones, like I said, that ha you can use bleach. Um, the one that, that probably covers everything the best is Viracon S um, that covers mostly everything, and a lot of the different companies use it. Uh, PBS has four or five different kinds, and like I said, you can pay $25 for a gallon, or you can pay $100, depending on what you, what you wanna wanna spend. Some of that stuff's real gross with the leather, though, too. Right. You're better off to have the rubber boots and then the yeah. clean rubber boots. Yeah. Or or the plastic. Right. Yeah. Nobody wants to bleach out their tennis shoes. Just use Clorox either. <laughs> so. Anything else? Wasn't trying to scare anybody, just trying to make you conscious, you know, remember when you go next door over here next Monday. Be careful. <laughs> Where you step and all that. Yes? Well, if you got a tray of liquid and everybody's walking through, 
<laughs> Don't put it in to any type of any type of water source. <laughs> Do not put it in any type of, you know, don't just throw it in the ditch or whatever. But you're not going to have a whole lot, so just putting it in the grass or whatever is not is not going to hurt most of those. They won't kill grass. It's not like you're doing 500 gallons or 100 gallons. Anything else? Just don't dump it in the stream, right, Josh? Yeah, when you look at the paper I gave you out, it talks about high-risk people, low-risk. I'm low-risk. I don't have a farm here. I do in West Virginia, but not here. Josh is low-risk. He lives in town. Caitlin and uh, Kevin back there have farms of their own. So, you know, the risk level um, is a little bit higher. So please be, just be aware of that and where you're going and, and what you're dragging in or not dra or what somebody else is dragging in that's going to get on your shoes and you take home. Okay? Yes? I just might add one of the things that we don't think about that's really important is international travel. We, we think about vacations and, and going places and we go to a different country. And that's what we want to do is get out, look at farms, look at agriculture in another area. There's diseases in other countries that we haven't had in this country for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it, we could bring something back. And we don't think about those things when we're out there doing that. So, so keep that in the back of your mind as well. Yes. A couple years, in 08, I took a bunch of students to Switzerland, Germany, and France. And it was an ag-related and we were very careful when we went to different farms and, and toured, uh, wore the plastic boots, even though we weren't going to come home and, and go anywhere for a while. But um, with when I know when avian flu was um, down in West Virginia, they would not. If you were on an infected farm, you could not go back on a farm for seven days. So like if my brother had to treat a farm that was infected, he was not, he was off for seven days. He was not allowed on any other farm or even down at the main office for seven days until that period was over. So, so basically you're telling us to not stress over this and to be like the African mosquito and realize that if we all just improvise, adapt, and overcome, that someday down the road that we can eat cows again, is what you're kind of telling us. Because like this guy back here, we, there's might not be anything much we can do, but, but do what we can, Right. is what you're saying, do what we can. Mm -hmm. But in the end, don't stress over it, and, and enjoy life, and enjoy your cows, and mm -hmm. hope they're happy, and they're not going to get diseased either, and the happier you are, the happier they are. Right. And maybe we can all live peacefully, is what you're telling us. Because in the end, if we're worried about bringing disease from another country, I mean, we got serious trouble. And, and the African mosquito just keeps improvising, adapting, and overcoming. And, and we're not like that. Us humans, we get sick on everything. Yeah. So hopefully someday us humans will adapt, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So we can all just like thank you, God, and we'll move on. Yeah. All right. You know, just take take your barn coveralls off yeah. before you go to sale. You know. I think it's awesome. Change your boots. Wash your truck tires off. Don't travel out through the field. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Don't stress over, it, but just think before you do, because like I said, a lot of times. We're in a rush. We, we always seem to be in such a rush. And we need, sometimes we just need to slow down and, and think about things and remember to do things. You know, I, I don't really want to wear my shitty boots into a dinner meeting like this. I don't think anybody does. So we just have to remember those things. Thank you very much. All right, so for those of you who 
don't know me, my name is Wendy Zadansky. I'm the Natural Resources Specialist with the Jefferson Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, I'm just going to kind of MC the next couple of speakers. So our next speaker is speaking on compost, manure, poultry litter, and other soil amendments. And most of you know him. This is Clint Finney. He is the Soil Conservation Technician for Harrison and Jefferson Counties for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. work yeah it is all right I apologize because I'm not my normal self although I'll probably be bouncing around up here trying to stay awake it's been a been a long week Kevin and I and Beth had the opportunity to go to uh, Pennsylvania last yesterday and uh, go to one of their grazing conferences got to see Greg Judy speak Teddy Gentry speak uh, talk to those guys so it was a cool deal but of course Beth and I left in the snow at six o'clock yesterday morning we got home at I don't know. Midnight, somewhere in there. I bred sows until one o'clock in the morning, so it's been it's been a long couple of days. And the, the, the day before that, I was in the farrowing house till four a.m. But that's another story. So um, I may not be myself, but uh, I'm not, may not be putting my full heart in it. Especially after you talk to Greg Judy and, and Teddy Gentry, and you get all wound up on other things other than talking about manure, man. We had a whole lot of other things to talk about than than that. And then I had to come home and we got to talk about that's um, soil amendments. Sorry. Um, <laughs> First thing, we're going to talk about soil amendments. We're going to beat it in your head, like sand in a rat hole, man. Soil test. We got the soil test. Before we put anything down, we got to know what's out there. We can't manage what we what we don't measure. So for the, those of you that need a review, three to four inches deep for, for pH, for a lime recommendation, six to eight for nutrients, 20 cores per test, no more than 20 acres, tested based on landform. Uh, and also what has been done in the past, soil is soil history. Fill out the testing information correctly. If you can't do that, please, please, please call us. We'll help you fill it out and get it right. Um, I, I get so many soil tests back that they, they, the people put down, they wanted eight ton of the acre of forage. Well, in Jefferson County, there's not any soils that produce eight ton of the acre. So I got to I gotta go dial them back a little bit and, and figure out what we need to put down. Not, not the recommendation for eight ton. So if we can do that, that's great. Get them back, follow the recommendations, talk to us, um, let, have us look at the soil samples, bring them to these meetings, you know. We're all more than glad to look at a soil sample quick and, and tell you what we think about what we're seeing on your soil sample. There's just the sample test information, stuff you've got to fill out. Josh, you're all right, you're, all right, you're getting me on? Okay, because my, my mother watches later. So. <clears throat> that's a typical, uh, typical soil test. Uh, of course, that's a lot of numbers. So a lot of you get this back and say, what does this say? Well, then that's the same test. Spectrum will send you one that says high, medium, and low. I'll tell you what, when I get this back, I'm a numbers geek. I hate looking at that high, medium, and low because their high, medium, low and our high, medium, low are two totally different things. They're not right. Um, Sometimes, I, I think this was the one I looked at. It's got phosphorus at, right at that high, very high. Well, if I look at it right, no, it's really not up to that very high level yet. I, I'm okay with it being in that range. In fact, I kind of want it to be in that range in a pasture situation because we're rotating nutrients all the time. We're taking it up in grass. We're putting it back down in manure. So, you know, have us look at it. If, if you have any questions, we'd be glad to help. I don't want to belabor too much on soil testing. We talk about it all the time. Another Penn State test gives you the same information, just a different form. Um, we're, we're glad to look at them and tell you, tell you what you're seeing. Then follow the recommendations. We, we go by the Tri-State Fertility um, Guide here in Ohio or the Ohio Agronomy Guide. I prefer the, the Tri-State stuff. It's what I learned on in college. Um, and I put on there, remember, you know, our, our forages are going to, going to remove 40 pounds of nitrogen, 13 pounds of, of phosphorus, and 50 pounds of potassium per ton of forage removed. Now, we're grazers. Our cows are putting some back, though. We got, we got, to, we got to account for that. You know, what do they put back? I, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but a lot of those nutrients, if we're grazing it, the cows are putting it right back on the pasture field. But it's it's in transit. It's kind of in limbo. It's like cash flow in hogs. You know, I I don't have any money. It's always blowed out to the feed company or halfway in between because I'm always feeding something. It's I, I tell people feeding hogs is like playing that cash explosion where the, the money's just floating around in, in the phone booth and you're just trying to grab a few of it. Uh, nutrients in a pasture field are kind of like that. They're kind of rotating around. If we're gonna talk about manure. I wanted to put talk, put this up here just right up front. And of course, good thing I remembered. I do have some handouts. I think I printed 30 of them. Sorry, Kendall. I forgot all about it. 
That, this chart is on there. Um, this is the setback distances, the NRCS, uh, an extension of a green two. It's what goes in our CNMPs. It's what we talk about when we spread manure. If you're going to do any kind of spreading of manure or compost, soil amendments, take a, take a look at these, at these uh, setback distances. Uh, we've got residences, uh, private wells, ponds, lakes, streams, ditches, waterways, all the different setbacks that we would like to see you follow uh, to help ensure that any of these amendments don't end up in the stream. If they do, you know, you're wasting money and you're causing problems down the stream. I wanted to put that up front because it's very important. We, we've got to pay attention to where we're spreading any kind of soil amendment. This specifically for manure, but we want, we want those things to be out there and for you guys to see. The second thing I, I have here is an available uh, water holding capacity chart. If, if you're in chilled ground, it works really well, and especially if you're spreading liquid manure, you want to use these this kind of guide to show you what you can spread and when you can spread liquid manure. Solid manure, we can get away with some things. Solid manure, we're not going to go out there in the field and spread when things are really wet anyway because it's heavy and we're going to run up the field. But you know, I, I don't never know who's coming here tonight and whether we're talking about liquid manure or whether we're talking about solid manure. But uh, in a dairy, you know, there's some guys get their back against the wall and they've got to get out and spread and, and they don't care whether they run up the field or not. They've got to get stuff spread. So we use this available water capacity chart to, to show how much they can spread depending on the soil conditions. So if, if any of you don't know, and I, I see some new faces tonight, we, we all get together in the winter and as a council, we kind of talk about what we want to talk about, um, what we want to talk about, what we want to cover for the year. Well, I got the SHI soil amendment category tonight. We want to talk about composting. We want to talk about chicken manure. We want to talk about this. We want to talk about that. So we kind of just lumped them all together to kind of talk about, we're talking about manure. We're talking in, in one form or another. Uh, the first one that, that folks want to talk about was composting manure. Um, we do a lot of composting at home. We, we, we use our heavy use pad mini manure and compost it before we spread it. We also compost mortality. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. That's a licensing thing, and we've got to have uh, qualified people in here to talk about it. But um, why would we want to compost? Why would we want to think about compost in our manure? Well, I just wrote these down as they came into my mind. This isn't scientific. I didn't read a huge book to be able to come up with them, but these are the things that I, the reason why I would. First is a reduction in overall volume. We start out with a huge amount of manure from wintertime from feeding cattle. We can push that all into a pile, rotate it a couple times, and we reduce that manure. We can reduce it sometimes down to a quarter of what we started with and take it out on the field. So we've got less loads we have to haul, less times we have to load a spreader, less trips out there to the field. The other is consistency. Um, if, if you've ever cleaned a heavy use pad feeding area, you, you know that there's places where the bale ring sat that's really hay laden. There's places that aren't, that are really wet and soppy. If we, we put that all together and compost it, we kind of mix it all together and we get a more consistent product out there in the field. I've seen heavy use pads cleaned off and I've seen where the fields have grown up in the spring and I can almost tell what, what kind of quality they spread because their, their grass is kind of the disc because it, didn't, it wasn't a consistent product when they spread. We're, in some cases, we can lock up some of the nutrients, the, the, nitri the, the nitrogen, the ammonia, especially in, in the manure. If we're composting correctly, we can lock up that ammonia and be able to keep a little bit more of it. We'll talk a, a little bit more about ammonia and manure when we get to talking about chicken manure, but um, ammonia is something that we lose typically in, in our spread manures. If we compost it and we compost it correctly, we can keep some of that. Now, not always. Sometimes we lose it. If we take tests before and after, sometimes we do keep it, sometimes we don't. But we've got a fair chance of keeping some of that ammonia if we, we do some composting. Reduce or eliminate weed seeds. Uh, <clears throat> we just talked about Palmer amaranth. You know, where you, where's your hay coming from? Is it, does it have weeds in it that you don't want? Do we want to compost that manure to make sure or at least help to kill some of those weed seeds? We may not kill them all. We've got to remember this is a natural process. Um, we're not out there with spacesuits and, and, and all kinds of fancy equipment and making sure we killed every single weed, but at least we can help reduce the weed pressure by composting. And then my, my favorite is adding add bugs to the soil. Um, basically, you're, you're getting uh, microbes to do the breaking down for you. You're getting that, that super charge. As I was talking, thinking about this today, well, how would I compare this to something else? You know, a lot of people eat yogurt to get their digestive system right. You know, I see them in commercials all the time. Compost is basically soil yogurt. If you want to think about that, think about it that way. We're throwing out all kinds of bugs and help feeding the soil and getting it going and getting it right. And, and you know, for my area of the state where, where I'm working in a lot of reclaimed ground that, that may or may not have any soil life in it at all, boy, this is an awesome product to put on that reclaimed ground because it helps to jumpstart that, helps to get those, those soils back in, back in uh, living condition. 
the compost and the geek numbers. Y'all know I'm a numbers guy. I like to do calculations. I like to do numbers. I figured I better show you the real numbers and how to compost. We need a 30 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. <clears throat> uh, how do we do that? How do we know that? We send it into a lab first and, and they can analyze what, what is our carbon to nitrogen ratio of our product. And do, then they can tell us, do we need to add sawdust? Do we need to add urea? Do we need to add something to it to make that carbon to nitrogen ratio right? 50 to 60 percent moisture. That's not real wet, folks. That, you put that in a ball in your hand and squeeze it. You're not going to squeeze any water out of 50 to 60 percent. It's, it's just wet. It's a wet material. I put 5 percent air and train for my civil engineering training. I, I know of air and train in concrete, right, Terry? We talk about 2 percent air in concrete. We want that compost to be 5 percent air. We got to have airspace in there. We're, we're we're dealing with aerobic bacteria, which is air, bacteria that likes oxygen, likes air, versus anaerobic bacteria, which is if you leave a heavy use pad, just kind of sit and pack and it, you get that smell to it. That's that anaerobic bacteria. It's working without oxygen. 6.5 to 8 pH. Um, a word about pH as, as we're going down the road here, in, in case I forget to talk about it later with manure. I hear a lot of times guys say, well, I don't really want to spread that manure on my field because I, I'll have to put lime on you know what? We can send a sample of your manure in and tell you what the pH is. But I can tell you most of the time it's not going to be that bad. You're not going to find that it's that it's that acidic, that it's going to affect your field. You may. There may be times you'll find it that it's, it's really acidic. But I tested dairy manure back in the day um, when I first started here. Before I started with the agencies, I worked in Columbia County. I was a manure nutrient management technician. Had a dairy farmer was really concerned about the the sawdust that was in his manure and how it was going to raise his pH. I went and tested it and tested out perfect seven. Every time I went to test it, it was perfect seven. So uh, it's not really the pH. The deal is the carbon and nitrogen ratio in that sawdust laid manure. It isn't. It isn't the acid. It's not the pH that's killing us. It's that carbon. When we spread that out on the soil, it's sucking nitrogen out of the ground to be able to get that carbon to break down. It's not the pH in, at all. Uh, and then we want it to get to 130, 130, 140 degrees, somewhere in there. Um, it's not going to go there like that, and it's not going to stay there forever. When it, it goes up to that temperature, it'll kind of stay around there, and then when it starts falling off, that's when we want to try to mix some more air in it to get it to, to cook a little bit more. But can we just do that with our bedded pack manure? Sure. Sure we can. Most of our bedded pack manure around here is going to be about right. It's, I, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be perfect. That, those are the perfect numbers. 20 to 40 is the real number. Are we going to be close to that with our bed pack manure? Sure. We're going to be close to that. Are we going to be close to that with moisture? Sure. We're going to be close to that. I included a couple pictures here uh, just to, to quick. I do have a pointer. Wow. Um, this barn here is, is Joel Salatin's barn. If you ever heard about Joel Salatin and the things he does in, in Virginia, this is his cattle barn and, and where he feeds hay in the wintertime. They square bale all their hay. They've only get, they only get 20 inches of rainfall a year, so the big open spaces in the barn don't bother much. They don't worry about spoilage in their hay. But he feeds those cows in this running shed, and they've got a hay feeder gate right here along the wall. That's all hooked to a cable, and he can crank that hay feeder gate up as the manure gets taller. But every time he, every, every once a week, they go through with corn and spread on the, the bedding. Then they go through with a um, spreader full of wood chips because he's got a sawmill. Spread wood chips on that bedding and then let the cows go in there, stay in there and eat and drag and waste hay and leave manure. Come spring, he fences that all off, turns a group of hogs in there, and the hogs do all the composting for him. He calls it pig raider pork. They get all that... They get all that taken care of, get it all ground up, get it all composted, and then he sells pork chops at the farmer's market and laughs all the way to the bank. It's amazing. <clears throat> There's just a typical compost pile, you know, what we would see if we were going to compost our own manure. <clears throat> There's kind of, you know, what you need to do. Simply push it into a manageable pile, something that you can manage with a loader on a tractor or a skid loader. In Ohio, the rainfall is going to be adequate to keep that thing water down enough most of the time we're going to have times when it's going to be too dry but if it stops composting we, we're going to it's going to restart when it gets enough water again it's, it's a natural process folks it's not something that's just going to be dead once it once it, if it gets too dry once it waters down that bacteria is going to come back again now if we want a perfect compost and we want to do it fast yeah we've got to have everything right but we don't have to have everything perfect to, to be able to compost our, our bed and lay the manure should be turned occasionally. I leave it on a heavy use pad. Every time I go by with a tractor and a bucket, I take a couple hits on it. Turn it around a little bit. You know, take out some frustration with the tractor. Why not? 
um, if, if, we, if it's not getting composted right, you know, if something's not working right, you can kind of look at it and know, you know, is it, is it way more manure than it is carbon? Is it way more manure than it is hay? Do we need to add some carbon to it? Do we need to add some nitrogen to it to get it to break down better? Is it really smelling when we turn it over? Do we want to put some sawdust on top of it to help cut down that smell? We can do those things. And it's always a good idea to test it before we go ahead and use it. Just like a manure test, run it through a lab somewhere, get it tested so we can figure out what's in it and, and what we're going to get out of it. We'll talk about that as we talk about manure too. Manure and poultry litter. I just got to the topics here listed of what we're, what we're going to cover here in a minute. But the one thing, and, and this will come up again later in our slide, this is the book value for our manures. Those are book values. Those come from Ohio State University. They, they took all the animals and locked them up in cages and who knows what they did to them to make sure. But I, I would say, you know, it can't be perfect because how, how do we make sure we captured everything from that animal? So as we go down the list here, we're gonna talk first about the test. Up here is the typical manure. And I, I someone asked at our winter meeting to talk about poultry manure. Well, I kind of lower lump poultry manure and, and all our manures together because we're dealing with a manure product, folks. It's it's sort of the same. Whether we purchase it or whether we produce it, we still got to manage it the same way. <clears throat> Up here, I left the, the book value for broiler manure. And I know you can't see it because it's too small, but let's just talk about the phosphorus. Book value phosphorus for broiler litter uh, is 15.6 pounds per ton. Over here, I've got a test from one of our barns in Harrison County. 45.38 pounds per ton. Three times the phosphorus of book value. So we can't always go by book value to figure out how many tons or how many pounds or whatever we have. That was, you know, these, these numbers that Ohio State did were years ago. Who knows what they've changed in the in the feed that they give them today. We could take a test out of that barn out of three different piles of coming from that same cleaning and get three different tests. Are they gonna be that far apart? No, because they've mixed it and carried it to a, a facility and they've mixed it in that facility. So it's pretty consistent, but they're gonna be different, just like a soil test. But just realize we can't go by book value. We've got to take a test to know what's actually out there. When you call me and say you wanna spread manure and how many loads should I put on an acre? I got no idea until we have a test to be able to know what's out there. Um, this other one is a, another standard test that Penn State sent us, 30 point, or, uh, somewhere around 35 pounds of phosphorus. So three different models of how to test for poultry manure and three totally different numbers, like way off the chart different numbers. So we need that test to be able to tell us what's in there. The other thing to talk about quick is uh, we get a manure test, it's also going to tell us what our micronutrients are. Uh, where And our soil test does that too, and we, don't, we tend to not worry about micronutrients, but it's kind of cool to, to look in that manure and see that where if we're buying commercial fertilizer we're not getting that we're not getting those micronutrients at least we're not getting ones that they want to tell us that we're getting there might be some things in there that we like chloride especially uh, anything with with potassium in it it's got chloride in it um so this this is telling us what our good micronutrients for soil are how do we figure the value i i, I shuddered about putting this in there because there's a lot of greek or a lot of geek clint finney math right here <clears throat> but i get questions all the time. What's my manure worth? What's that poultry litter worth? What's it really worth to us? So I want to quickly go through it. If you don't understand, that's fine. I'm perfectly cool with running the calculation for anybody. If you get a test from somebody you want to buy poultry litter from, buy dairy manure from, buy hog manure from, get a test, send it to me. I'll be glad to look, go through it and tell you what. All I need is that test and a test from the co-op that you would typically buy your fertilizer from. And in 10 minutes, I can have you number. <clears throat> Basically, it's a complicated calculation but it can be done in several ways first we need to know the available nitrogen we need to know what nitrogen we're going to get out of that manure uh in the test that i had before there they come from the barn from harrison county and this is a typo in my slides from the total test nitrogen it's not the total nitrogen it's the organic nitrogen in that test was 31.09 pounds per ton the back of that manure test though you get to reading it and it'll say if your service applying it and not going to cover it up within seven days and it's in the spring you're only going to keep 60% of that organic nitrogen right off the bat. You're going to lose all of the organic nitrogen, or all of the ammonia nitrogen. It's all going to go up to the air, and you're only going to keep 60% of the organic. Now, the 60% of the organic that you keep, the rest of it you're going to get in successive years. It's going to take years for it to break down. The bacteria is going to break it down. You're going to get it. But in this example, I, and if I'm going to buy chicken manure, if I'm going to buy manure at all, I want to know how it's going to affect me today. I don't, the next couple years down the road, we don't know what's going to happen there. It may get washed through the soil profile and not ever get used. The legumes may take it up. We may get more addition because of the legumes. I want to know what it's going to do today. So today, 
that manure is going to have 18.65 pounds per ton. That's that's from the actual test here in Harrison County. So our manure actually, what we're going to get to use, there's your values for what we're actually going to get to use out of that manure. Now we need to know what the fertilizer values are so we can compare it. Uh, this come from, I, I don't know that these are current, current prices. These might have been last fall's prices. Um, urea price, $325 a ton. Triple 19, 360, 0060, um, $300 a ton. Now, this is where it gets complicated. So follow along with me. 2,000 pounds of, of fertilizer, right? Urea is 46% nitrogen. Take 2,000 times 46%. <clears throat> that's how many pounds of actual nitrogen is in that ton, 920 pounds. 920 pounds of actual nitrogen in a ton of, of urea. Divide that by three, divide 325 by 920, you get that that nitrogen costs 35 cents a pound. We do the same thing with, with uh, K2O, 0060, 300, it's $300 a ton. Take a ton of fertilizer, 2,000 pounds times 60%, that's, a, that's 1,200, 1,200, is that right? Yeah, 1,200. 12, 300 divided by 1,200 is 25 cents a pound. So we know what fertilizer costs by nitrogen and, and potassium. Triple 19 is a little harder to figure out. That top part is the calculation we just went through. Now, triple 19, 19% of 2,000 is 380 pounds. So 380 pounds times 35 cents of, for nitrogen plus 380 pounds times 25 cents. Ah, oh, crap, there's another typo. Should be K2. Beth, I thought you checked that. <laughs> a little bleary eyed huh so the total comes to two she, she just trusts me to do the math that's why 220, 228 pounds per ton for the nitrogen and, and potassium in that fertilizer so take 360 for triple 19 minus 228 <clears throat> we already know there's 380 pounds of phosphorus in there divide those numbers you get around 0.35 pounds dollars per pound of phosphorus so there's the math. We said our poultry litter had this content. Multiply it out. That's what you pay for each one. The total in the end for that poultry litter right now, around $30 a ton. Now, the thing you're going to say is, what about the micronutrients? We're going to buy them too. We're getting them. Micronutrients, you can do the same thing. You just got to know the fertilizer price. But in this manure, I, I figured it was somewhere between a dollar and seven dollars worth of extra micronutrients you were going to get. This particular producer told me, I only want to know what the N, P, and K value is this time. I'll send you another sample of the next couple, over the next several years. When I get a baseline established, we're going to go with my lowest sample, and that's what I'm going to charge people. Yes, I'm going to test it every time, but I want, I want to make sure that I get a baseline established so that everybody buys manure from me knows that I'm, they're getting what I, what I told them they were going to get. But so don't, don't take this to the bank. You know, everybody's chicken litter isn't worth $30 a ton. Some of it might be more, some of it might be less, but it's a way for us to calculate how much chicken litter, poultry litter is actually worth. We've got to take into account now how much it's gonna to cost to get it to our farm. We've got to take into account now also how much is it gonna to cost to deal with those setback distances and some other things we've got coming in the next few slides. Remember, is I stole this from Kevin. I'll be right up front, I stole it. We talked about that 40-13-50. Four tons of forage takes this, this content of fertilizer. But two tons of that poultry litter we just talked about is going to do 37 pounds of nitrogen, 90 pounds of phosphorus, and 63 pounds of potassium. I don't quite, quite line up left and right here. And there ain't no way we can make those numbers line up correctly. So we've got, we've got to have a soil test. We've got to have that test both so we know whether you've got the room to take those either extra nutrients or whether we need to apply those, those other nutrients with fertilizer if that's what we're going to do. Realize the risk. I, I enjoyed having Sandy here to talk about biosecurity. I'm a hog farmer. Y'all look at her like she was weird there for a little while about all that thing and, and talking about, you know, I'm not trying to scare you. Listen, I have worn those plastic boots since I was two years old. When my uncle farmed in Kentucky, we had boots that we wore at home, we had boots that we wore to church, and we had boots we wore to Kentucky. Um, everything we did was biosecurity. I remember my first time, Stuart, going to ATI. First thing I did, put on a pair of boots. Terry didn't have to bring them out to me. We had them in the truck because we were used to it. It's, that's just a normal way of doing things. Did you ever get to go to a place that uh, 
You stepped in the shower and had to put somebody else's clothes on. I, I, and I never have, thank God, but I didn't want to go in that bad. I knew what hogs smelled like. I didn't need to go in there and see. <clears throat> and, but there are, there, there are operations like that here in this county. You, you, some of you beat guys may not realize it. Our state veterinarian will tell you, he's, he, at times in his life, he averaged 14 showers a day in and out of facilities. So this, I mean, this biosecurity stuff's kind of new to beef producers, but to us hog producers and chicken producers, this is something that we've been doing for a long, long time. I mean, and, and, and yes, we, we want you to take it seriously. We want you to think about it. And, and some of it's tongue in cheek too, but realize I've had purrs at my house in the hogs. I've had the flu in the hogs. I've had six months, eight months where I didn't have a single litter because of that biosecurity stuff. And at that time, in those times, we didn't know where we got it from. So if you can take care of it without it getting to you, you're better off. You know, I do everything I can not to have to have it. But to go along with that hog knowledge, you know, realize the risks. I have talked to the EPA several times personally. I know people, that, my dad knows people at the EPA because they call whenever we spread manure on a certain farm. I mean, personal basis. Every time, they, every time we spread there, they call and say, same setbacks, yeah, same setbacks, same field, yeah, same field. All right, we've been there, we know everything's good, we're not going to bother taking a trip out. But they have, they made a trip out because our neighbors weren't real happy with us spreading hog manure. So realize the risk, you know, realize the neighbor relations. One of the guys we listened to yesterday talked about he, he bought a farm and didn't realize that all the tracks around him were sold to a subdivision before he really got up and running. I forget what he said, 38 neighbors? 30, yeah, well, I mean, in the subdivision, but, like, direct property owners, he had 38 or something like that, and then hundreds in the subdivision behind him. Um, and, you know, so think about all those neighbors. you got to keep happy. <clears throat> so the best thing ever happened to him was a bottle calf, man. Every The neighbors were lined up to feed that thing. Imagine, it should have been like Tom Sawyer should charge him for it. <clears throat> <laughs> Neighbor relations, man, we got to... We got to talk to the neighbors. We got to tell them when we're spreading. He said, you know, spread manure on Father's Day just ain't exactly a good idea. <laughs> spreading manure on Valentine's Day will get you in trouble. Trust me, it's worse to piss off their wife than it is the husband. <clears throat> I learned that out a long time ago. <clears throat> she don't like it when the flies land on her car. We got to talk. We got to think about runoff losses too, though, and potential problems downstream. And with all seriousness, it happens all the time. We see it everywhere. We, the reason I passed up those setback distances, I've seen springs run liquid hog manure for days, where they've been injected, where they've just injected liquid manure. I've seen that with dairies in Harrison County. I've seen a spring run straight dairy manure for days. Uh, we got to be real careful about where we spread manure. Those were liquid situations. I realized we're talking about dry tons. Chicken manure is light. Chicken manure likes to float. Sometimes chicken manure is really dry, and you would think it would just suck up moisture and sit there on the ground, and it does not. It likes to go whenever rain hits it. Um, if I'm going to spread chicken litter, I want to do it either as early as we are allowed to in the spring or late in the fall. I don't want to take a chance with those thunderstorms in the summer if I can help it. If I'm in a place where, where that runoff risk is a problem. If I'm in somewhere where I don't have to worry about waterways. You ever seen my farm? I've got a waterway every 30 feet. <clears throat> it's just a risk you got to take. Something you got to look into. you got to be careful with where that stuff spread. And then we got to talk about potential soil nutrient buildup. You know, our soil is already at 80, for 80 pounds per acre of phosphorus. If they're already 80, we ain't, you know, there's, there's no need to spread manure. We've already got enough. If, if uh, we're already 150, 200, depending on our CEC on, on potassium, we've already got enough. What are we doing more for? I get tests all the time from crop guys. Their, their nutrients are off the chart, and they're talking to me about fertilizer. I'm like, why are we talking about fertilizer? Well, i got to get a good crop. Dude, you're going to be okay. I, I mean, I'd love to take some of your fertility and take it to my house. Why don't you just give me the fertilizer? Because you're wasting it at this point. Have a plan and discuss it with us, you know, especially if you're going to spread manure. You know, let's talk about it. Let's see where you're going to spread it. Um, <clears throat> we, we're not, you know, I'm not going to tell you it's a bad idea. I'm just going to give you some of the risks. We can compost chicken litter. We can compost dairy manure. We can compost stuff that you bought in. I mean, we're kind of talking about bought in fertilizers here at this point or bought in manures. It can be composted. Chicken manure is rough. It takes, it's about one part sawdust to one part chicken litter to get it to, to compost. Now, realizing sawdust is a lot lighter, I'm talking about one part is in one truckload or one truckload. Sawdust is a lot lighter, but we, then we have to mix it up, get it mixed efficiently. It can be done. 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to try some one time. I never, I, I mean, I can do it in the math. I've never really seen anybody try to do it. I'm sure somebody has. I'd like to try it just to see if it knocks down that smell some for the neighbor relations end of things. Um, then we can add, you know, we can add carbon to that chicken litter with sawdust, wood chips, hay. There again, it'll help us keep some of that ammonia nitri nitrogen if we want to do that. Follow the setbacks. We talked about the setbacks. I'm like soil tests, and I'm going to pound that in your head. Setbacks, setbacks, setbacks. Make sure you follow those setbacks. You know, uh, back in the day when, when they spread a lot of municipal sludge around, I remember the story of, the, of them coming out, a farmer somewhere here, and, and doing the setbacks for them because they could, they follow. Actually, theirs were like double what we follow. They couldn't spread sludge within blah, blah, blah of everything. And when they come out one day, they had set out flags. They couldn't spread within it. The farmer was inside the flag spread manure because he was allowed to because that's what NRCS said. They packed up and left because they said at this point, they can't tell whether the manure entering the stream is manure or whether it's municipal waste. And we can't, they couldn't take that risk. They had to leave. So th those guys have been following these setbacks for a long time. We've got, to, we've got to do a good job of following the setbacks. Calibrate your spreader. How many of you calibrated a spreader? Bev, I'm surprised. No, I figured you guys had. Kevin and I used to do it. I, I've done it a long time. Um, if you've got a liquid spreader, it's real easy because you know how many gallons it holds. You can go out and measure the spread pattern. Do some simple math, you got it. If we've got a solid spreader, it's a lot harder. You know, we could probably do it in bushels per acre. The bushels don't tell us much unless we get a manure sample that tells us the density and all that stuff. And not real good. So what we can either do is we can weigh your spreader. If you've got the availability of a scale, we can weigh it empty, weigh it full, measure the spread pattern. Or we can throw out a tarp, spread across it, throw that tarp on a scale, tell you how many pounds you spread per tarp, and then we can calculate it out per acre. But if you're going to buy nutrients, especially if you're going to buy chicken litter, you want to know how much you're going to put down. Because if you put down four or five tons of the acre, it's going to be a mess real quick. We want to know that you're only putting down two or three ton, probably at the most. Um, and then the next, and this is just manure in general, and I don't know, with my NRCS folks standing back there looking at me getting ready to throw rotten tomatoes because I brought up the CNMP word. Yes, some of us may have to be thinking about this. And I go, yeah, um, these days are coming. If you don't know what a CNMP is, it's a comprehensive nutrient management plan. Some of us in the room have one. I have one for the hog operation. Cows are included because of the hogs. Um, the, days, the days might be coming that we'll need to be thinking about a CNMP. Uh, there's, there's rumors that if we can find cattle for more than 45 days on a heavy use pad, we're a feeding operation and therefore should have a CNMP. That's rumored to be coming down the pike. So uh, Harry's back there nodding his head. I, I don't, I know I'm there with, I'm, I'm with Sandy and by security, I'm going to go hide by the door before we leave just in case you guys run me out of town. But I, here I'm telling you, know that word and, and know that those days are, are coming at, at some point. You know, we're, we're going to talk about CNMPs probably more and more. It's not a bad thing. Shoot, right now you can sign up for a CNMP with NRCS and they'll help you pay for it. Get your fields all marked out. Get them hard numbered. Get them soil sampled. Get it all in one place. Get records that, that you can follow. Um, ensures compliance. Gives you legal standing. Gives you a rate per acre that you can spread manure. Kind of a cool deal. It just takes a lot of work. It's a lot of, it's a lot of looking into, a lot of soul searching at times to, to be able to get all that stuff down on paper. We'll talk about other soil amendments. Um, I listed all three of them there, but just remember, you know, we're going to talk about pH. This, this is the, the famous pH scale and, and how available our nutrients are. If we're off that 6.5 or above that 8, our nutrients start to fall off in availability. So that's why we're going to talk about lime. Three different sources. I hate to go down this road because we get in this discussion every year, but I, it's fine. We can talk about it. Ag ground limestone, limestone dust, and pelletized lime. Ag ground limestone is something you buy from your co-op as lime. What I consider limestone dust is what you go to the quarry and buy. I get a lot of that down home. Well, we're, we're going to buy it from the quarry. It's just lime anyway. And then pelletized lime. Let's talk a minute about it. Ag ground limestone is going to be 90, 100% effective. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. If you put down a ton, you're going to get almost a ton out of it, of, of neutralizing power. You go spreading ag or limestone dust, you might get 30%, you might get 50%, you might get 60% if you're lucky. Um, you better have got it cheap is what I'm telling you. 
you better have a test there again so we know how much you did, so we know how much you got, so you know what the, uh, the effective neutralizing power is. I, all the time I hear, well, I can get it for $20 a ton. It's $40 a ton at Landmark. Well, yeah, but you're only getting half the, the value, so how much more does it take? And you're putting out a bunch of yuck from that lime that you didn't really want, things you didn't want in the field. Pelletized lime, I, I, I get asked this. Well, should I put pelletized lime? Listen, it's the same stuff. It's just ground down finer and put in a pellet. Works a little faster. Other than that, if it says you need a ton of calcium carbonate per acre on your soil sample, it doesn't matter whether it's ag ground limestone or pelletized lime, still takes the same amount, one way or another. We get a rumor going around every once in a while that all you can do is less pelletized lime. Uh uh, it doesn't work that way. Lime is lime, calcium is calcium. It, 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 you, you can't do that. It, it takes the same amount no matter what you do. Does it work faster? Sure, it works quick. That one like ag ground limestone, it may take six months to three years to finally work. But we're in the grass business. We got time. That's the way I see it. Now, Kevin, you know, Kevin uses pelletized lime at home because he can get it in a buggy. One buggy will cover the whole entire farm. He remembers to do it every year. It comes out of the budget every year, and it works for him. That's great. If you can justify it, you can make it work for you, that's great. I, uh, it's a perfect way to put down lime. Do it once a year rather than waiting for every 10 years in your leggings to die off before you put lime. Just, just letting you know. Keep in mind, if we're, adding, if we're adding lime, you know, we're talking about soil calcium. We want that base saturation of calcium to be 60 to 80 percent. So, and also, what you got to think about? Now we're putting lime down. Is this the time for magnesium? Are your soils low in magnesium? Typically, the soil samples we see are not. But that doesn't mean we're, we're, we're not always going to see it. There's some soil samples we find that are low in magnesium. Ah, oh, no, Josh, what did I do? All right, Josh is the doctor, man. <laughs> Magnesium, we'll talk quick. 15% of the base saturation. Make sure your, your, your MG to K ratio, 2.1%. This is important because we're talking about manure. We're talking about adding extra potassium than what we need. More potassium than what we can handle. Use dolomatic limestone to add that magnesium. Gypsum, we talked about it last year. I don't want to kill it forever. It's not lime. It ain't lime. That's all I can say about that. It ain't lime. I hear it all the time. Now, I'm going to get some of that stuff from the power plant and use it. It ain't lime, folks. Uh, we got places in Jefferson County where there's white product laying all over the place, and it ain't even close to lime. And farmers used to spread it in, in place of lime. Realizing there's natural and industrial different kinds of gypsum. We can mine gypsum or we can get it, we can get it from industrial sources. The thing I thought was cool, this was Kevin's slide again. I stole it. But... The industrial, the FGD, actually is lower in heavy metals than the mined version is. It's because the EPA keeps that bad stuff from being turned loose. If you can get it from the power plant, they're already going to know that it's low in those heavy metals. But you got to be real careful about, about applying gypsum. I mean, I'm not saying you can't. It's one of those things that you, if you need calcium and you've already got a pH that's, that's good, you can think about applying gypsum. I go back to that limestone dust at the gravel quarry for 20 bucks a ton then, though. If I, if I need calcium bad enough, I might try adding a little bit of that and take a soil sample next year and see what that did for me. Might have added some calcium to the soil without changing the pH. <clears throat> Micronutrients, remember, we, you know, we've got to think about them. Um, boron, copper, you know, forest analysis is going to tell us what. Hopefully, we've talked enough about mineral mix that a lot of you are doing that. Realizing that that mineral mix is going to help so much with the with the MG to, to potassium ratio, it's going to help so much with these micronutrients. I, I slid this slide in here. I just had this bull. I got to tell myself. I just go to Google and I look up pictures, and that's how I pull out pictures. I, so I pulled this bull, and I didn't realize till right before I left. You probably can't see it, and I'm colorblind, so I can't barely see it. But this bull has got kind of a little red tinge to him on his back. It's a telltale sign. He needs copper. Now, it's not always a telltale sign. We've got to take a soil sample. We've got to take a forage sample. We're we'll probably going to take a manure sample and see what their, their levels are in copper. But that's a telltale sign that they're kind of low in copper. You start seeing that red hair on their ears, red-tinged hair on their body. That's a copper sign. There's your list of micronutrients. I just put it in there because y'all were getting the slides. So if you get a soil sample, you can kind of look at the, at the micronutrients, see where you're at with that. Quick last three slides. Nutrient placement. You know, think about where we're going to put our dollar. I don't know about y'all, but I, I'm not, 
exactly flush with cash. So when I got to think about buying fertilizer, it's not to cover the whole farm all the time. It's to cover what I need to be covering. But think about what what areas your farm produce the most forage and what areas will produce the most forage. That's where you're going to get your fertilizer bang for your buck, whether it's commercial fertilizer, whether it's manure. I put on here Steinsberg versus Keene in the south. That's my farm there on the southwest quadrant right here. There's a Keene soil type and a Steinsberg surrounds it all the way on, each, on around. And, and it's kind of got trees in it, some oak trees and things. But if you know, look at those, or you know those two soil types, you look at them on the soil survey, that Steinsberg is rated at about two and a half tons per acre pasture production. Keene's rated at about eight, just shy of eight. If I'm gonna put fertilizer on either one of those two fields, if one of them isn't producing enough, I'm putting mine on Keene and I'm leaving that Steinsberg alone. Oh, it's cows carry nutrients to it because it's not gonna it's not gonna give me any bang for my buck. I can't you know I'm, I I can't make a Kentucky Derby winner out of a mule, dude. That's that's what you're redoing with the Steinsberg soil type. Chemical versus manure. You know I think that's part of what we were talking about this tonight for was to think about the difference. What what are you going? I hate to even put chemical fertilizer, but it, or commercial fertilizer. It, it it is more chemical in nature where manure is more. Organic. I gotta put that in quotes because I'll get sued if I don't. Organic people get me, but I'm organic, folks. Take it easy. Buy, <clears throat> buy only the nutrients that you need. Where manure, you kind of get whatever you get. Um, fertilizer can be applied in measurable units. Manure is kind of unhandy to match up those nutrients. We don't have to worry about smell with commercial fertilizer. The neighbors will worry about smell. We spread manure. Minimal runoff concerns versus lots of runoff concerns. But then when it comes right down to it, what are we thinking about? Cost and all other things. What do we do with manure? Um, and I, 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 I thought about this last slide for a while, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to put it in there, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Maybe it'll spark some, some, some discussion. If, if my two cents worth on the, on the subject, I'll go with manure if. I'll go with manure if there's no real runoff concerns uh, for the field. If I've got a good relationship with my neighbors. I'll go with good with manure if our soil test values across the board are low. If I've, if I've got to raise those soil test levels. If my base uh, case saturation is less than 3 to 5%. That falls right along with low across the board. If my magnesium to potassium level is cool. I, I'm, most of the time they're in the 5 to 1 range anyway. So can we apply manure? Sure. And also if our phosphorus isn't above 80 pounds, that, that, that falls right in with that, that low, you know, if our soil tests, tests are low. We're, uh, we're, we're going to see, I think, we've got some of the chicken producers here. Um, we're going to see more and more of these barns as, as time goes by. They're going to keep coming. Um, we've got two more brand new barns being built in Harrison County right now. Uh, we've got to think about that manure has got to go somewhere. We, we're going to have to use it. One time, just with book values, I sat down and calculated with the original barns, the ones they built 10, 20 years ago. I figured that that barn was going to have to have, if the soil test levels were good in all of Harrison County, which if you've ever been to Harrison County, you know our flower is poverty grass. If, you're, if our levels were good, We'd have to have 500 to 1,100 acres to spread the manure from just two barns at, at removal rates for hay. So that, that product's going to be out there. It's something that we all have to think about using, um, something that's going to be around for a while. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good product um, as long as we can cover all our bases and keep us going. The other thing is I, I, I go with that word, the organic part of it. It's, it's a more natural kind of fertilizer. It's going to work for us a little bit different. We, uh, sound science is killing us, folks, and, and we've all, uh, well, you know, we don't know whether eggs are good for us or whether butter is good for us from day to day. And, and I got all this soil fertility knowledge pounded in my head in college, and I'm here to tell you that we're finding out that some of it's not exactly right. These, these numbers change all the time. When I was in college, 100 pounds of phosphorus was good. Now we're down to 80. When I was in college, we had set set calculations. We figured to raise your soil test levels. Now it's, it's all depending on how much you need to raise it. We can tell you how much you need to put down. We're finding out that commercial fertilizer, you know, are we getting what we're paying for? We're not quite sure. I mean, I, I, I am, and here again, we're talking about Clint Finney's two cents worth. I'm talking from my own personal. 
We went, we went to see Dave Brandt and see all the stuff he does with cover crops. And he's got soil samples where he didn't apply any fertilizer, but his, his soil test levels went up. Scientists said that was impossible. It happened. We've got new soil testing methods now that we can test stuff with. It's not testing with different chemicals that the soil will never see. And, and they're proven that these cover crops and these diverse mixes are, are, are taking levels up from where they were before. Where else can we do that better than in a pasture field? We ought to be able to put a diverse mix out there and make our soil house good and, and grow some nutrients. We ought to be able to see that. You know, and, and in time, I think that's what we're, this group is we're kind of looking at. You know, how can we, can we make that soil diverse and, and what, can we see some changes from it? So why I put soil testing first? Test your soil. Keep testing it. They tell us to test, test our soil every year if we're applying manure. Last I checked, that cows were applying manure about every 15 minutes. I wanted to add in that um, if you live in Carroll County and um, your pasture is there, that the Soil and Water Office is pulling uh, soil samples for free right now. So if you need a soil test done on your pasture, um, please take one of our postcards or see Josh and I so we can get you signed up for the if you live, I'm, I'm thinking about moving. <laughs> if you live in Carroll County, man, sign up for that deal. That is awesome. And then they get it in the soil and water office. You get it compared. They can kind of compare it to what how things are going. It serves their purpose. Serves your purpose. That's great. Thanks, Caitlin. Yes. Caitlin, that's, that's uh, limited to how many? One per producer. Yeah. Like yeah. How many producers are we doing? Um, we had 50 that were in it. Unlimited. An additional 50. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> First come, first serve. First come, first serve, John says. But hey, just one sample, if you haven't done it in a while, is going to tell you something. And, and while they're doing it, why don't you go ahead and pull a couple more with them while they're there? I guarantee you'll be talking to them that long anyway. You might as well go ahead and pull a couple more and pay for it. With that, that's all I got, unless there's any questions. Yes, sir. Can you explain that last one? What? In the case of high-end manure. Oh, I didn't read that one, huh? In the case of high nitrogen manure, and we don't mind losing or replanting legumes. If we've got high nitrogen manure, realize that legume plant produces nitrogen in a symbiotic relationship with the soil and the bacteria, and it's producing nitrogen to feed to its brothers and sisters in the forage world or crop world, depending on what your persuasion is. If we go and apply a bunch of nitrogen to legumes, over time that legume kind of loses its stature. It's no longer the queen of the forages. Nobody cares about it anymore. So it, it tends to go away. So we've got to go in and replant them after we get done. If, if we're putting out high nitrogen manure. But if we're putting out high nitrogen manure, we don't need to worry about it. <clears throat> you know, if you've got a great source of chicken litter and you're putting out enough nitrogen every year to keep your, your grass happy, we don't have to worry about legumes. Now, would I, would I worry? Yes, I, I want the diversity out there. But we don't have to worry about them so much. Um, but, yeah, you can kill out. Your, your legumes with high nitrogen manure, or you can severely hamper their growth. Does it, does it actually kill them, or is it just... It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't kill, kill. It just it, it makes them less and less viable over time because they're not going to produce it. And, and I don't have all the answers here. I'm making up some of this on the fly, but here, here's the way it goes. They're, they're making nitrogen as a part of their, their general process. When we apply so much nitrogen in the soil, that plant quits producing nitrogen. So it's not doing its normal biological process and therefore dies out because of it. <clears throat> yes, Stuart. Doesn't the grass overcompete? Oh, yeah, the grass is going to overcompete, too. Yes, that's also going to do it. Yeah, yeah. think about the grass is solid on the ground where the legume's kind of one stem and, and up here. It's going to help to compete. Yes, it's not going to outcompete it, too. <clears throat> Not something to worry about. You know, we, we talked last, last time with Bob Hendershot, and this kind of hit my mind late, and I didn't think about it. He says, well, we only need 30% legumes. Now, my mind's always been saying, yeah, but I'd like to have 50. I'd like to have 60. But you know what? Legumes are going to test 22, 24% protein, 30% protein. Our cows don't need 30% protein. Part of the reason why they want 30% legume out there is because that produces enough nitrogen to keep our grass going, but also doesn't jack our protein percentage up to where it's too much for the cows. 
Any other questions? Yes, Mr. McCarns. Yes. How do you limit that? Can you spread that on the grass? Eight inches high, and the leaves absorb some of that. Any cover you put on it's going to help. Oh, I got to re—I got to reiterate the question. Okay. John wants to know the ammonia nitro nitrogen. How can we not lose it? Well, the best way—well, I wouldn't say the best way. The the way that we do in cropping is tillage. Not the best way, but John asked about if we could put on eight or ten inches of forage. Any cover we put over, it's going to help. It's not going to limit it. I mean, not completely. We're not ever going to keep it. The only way we're going to keep it is with composting or biochar. Kevin's back there jumping up and down. Kevin has had lots of coffee tonight. <laughs> this is for you, YouTube. <clears throat> he, he, Kevin's also volunteered at this point to talk to us about biochar because he learned about it last night or yesterday at the, at the grazing council or grazing conference we went to biochar and kevin will be glad to talk about that when he comes up here in just a minute <laughs> yeah it's not a subject he can get into forever but it's something we need to have kevin talk about in in the future any other questions all right mr swope or i guess wendy has to introduce you first <laughs> Our final speaker for the night is Kevin Swope, who is the resource conservationist at Encaro County for the USDA NRCS, and he is going to help us understand if warm season grass is an option for filling summer swamp. Right. I've been to way too many trainings this uh, spring or late winter, so I've got all kinds of new ideas and new things that I think as a group we, we really need to consider. I spent... Uh, the last two days at the uh, grazing conference in in Pennsylvania, uh, Greg Judy was there. You know, we we always talk about all the mechanical things, the chemical fertilizer, and everything else that we need. Greg Judy, for those of you, any of you heard of him? Okay, he farms 1,600 acres and he doesn't even own a tractor. Okay, <laughs> no equipment. So it's something for us to consider. Huh? <laughs> Not good for the equipment here. <laughs> someone has to buy that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does he sell used equipment? He can sell all our used equipment. <laughs> so, Rush off the tractor last fall, so he must have sold that. Yeah, and maybe he did, but I mean, for the most part, you know, they he does not. Yeah, and he uses a four-wheeler, so maybe you want to get in the four-wheeler business. <laughs> but at any rate, you know, I want to go over our mission, you know. Our, our mission is to promote the conservation of soil and water by growing and grazing forages. Okay, that's the mission of, of why this group is here, and we're here to do this in a sustainable fashion. And uh, Kendall and Cliff and I were at uh, the Ohio Forage and Grass and uh, Bruce and Bev were there also. And I have messed around with some switchgrass and some warm season grasses. For those of you who may have been on our farm, uh, you've seen some of this. So I came, or we went to this, and I really didn't expect to learn much of anything. And I came away thinking, we've been screwing this up for a long time. There, there's some possibilities and some things. I have been totally mismanaging everything that I've done with my switchgrass fields. And I came away with a whole new perspective on what we might accomplish with warm season grasses. This whole presentation, this is not my presentation, it's one they sent to me. Uh, Dr. Kaiser was from the University of Tennessee. Some of the data that's here relates to Tennessee and that fescue belt. We are in, and, and a lot of you are managing fescue and are in that fescue belt. I have some of it, but I'm not managing it or trying to manage it like some of, of you folks are. But just be aware that, that, that I've completely gleaned this pub, uh, they, they sent it to us so that we could use it. And I want to just kind of go over this. I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, but this is just some of the hows and the whys of why we might want to consider that. Has anybody else in here tried to manage or plant any native warm season grasses? Nobody. Okay. All right. So what I'm hoping to do is at least whet your appetite. I'm not going to give you all of the all of the particulars, but I will say that if any of you are interested in this, get a hold of us. Don't just go out and try to do it on your own. Okay, we're going to try to work with Billy. There's some things, you know, they, they were presenting it for some of the wildlife benefits, but uh, don't try to go out and do it on your own. Ask for some help. 
and I really only really want to focus on switchgrass. And while I'm talking, I'll pass these two things around, and you'll see for a number of reasons that the data shows switchgrass, in my opinion, does a, a superior job to some of the other uh, grasses. There's Indian grass, there's big blue stem, there's some other uh, gamma, eastern gamma grass. The switchgrass, I know we have equipment to plant that. No, Harrison County has a Great Plains drill. Uh, Columbiana has machines. Uh, Carroll has machines. We can get this stuff planted and we can be successful at it. We'll just go ahead and work through here. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do with this, keep in mind the warm season grasses, when we talk about uh, a warm season grass, we're talking about grasses that will grow in the heat of the summer. They are a native, they call them a C4 grass. You'll see that throughout here. They are not what you, they're, you manage them totally different. They're completely different than your cool season, your C3 cool season grasses like tall fescue, orchard grass, timothy, and those sort of things. They grow at a completely different time of the year. How many of you I mean, every year, how many of you get concerned about how dry it gets? <laughs> Anybody here get concerned and start watching that? Okay, I know that, you know, for me, it's, it's somewhat amazing at how much different the soils are when we get down into this region from where I'm at. I'm in Columbiana County. My soils are glaciated soils. Do, do they dry out? Yeah, we, we can suffer from drought and we get dry. But the soils that I'm dealing with on my farm are completely different than the soils that you folks are dealing with, whether you're dealing with strip mine ground or just unglaciated soils. Your soils are different, and I'm amazed at how fast they get dry. Okay, almost every year we start, we see a period where things get dry and our forage growth slows down. This was, again, dealing with Tennessee area, but they were showing that over the last... Uh, five out of the last ten years, they've had extreme droughts. Ohio was involved in one of these here in 2012. Even 2011 may have reached some of us. You know, every year, well, 2007, it's creeping up. I mean, uh, almost every year you see we're in that region as well. So we start suffering from periods where things are getting dry. Again, our mission is to grow forage. We want to graze forage. We do not want to be making hay. Okay, I'm going to say that again. We do not, sorry for the equipment dealers, we do not want to be, as soon as you start feeding hay, you're draining money out of your pocketbook. I don't care how, we can discuss that all day long. As soon as you begin to feed hay, it's costing you money. We want the cheapest thing that we're going to ever feed is forage that we grew. And there, there isn't anything to debate about that. Okay? So, as you're working to understand your grazing systems and your grasses, these are just lumping warm season and cool season grasses or comparing those. They're not even comparing uh, according to species, but these are the typical January to December growth curves that we see. Uh, I hope everybody that's grazing forages is somewhat familiar with this. You may not have it completely memorized, but that lighter green, those are, that's the growth curve of our cool season grasses. Where these warm season grasses fit in are obvious. You know, they begin their growth period in May. They peak out June, July, and August. So they are filling that void. We don't want to think that we're going to go out and we're going to plant our entire, entire farm to this. That's not what we're promoting. You're going to pick or consider a portion of your operation to potentially do this. And all we're trying to do is, and you think about this, what do we want to try to do with, with tall fescue? How many of you are managing tall fescue? Very many. How many of you have it on your farm? Probably half or better have tall fescue on your farm. Where do you really like to feed tall fescue? Winter. Winter. Tall fescue, they had a guy there today who just happened to be speaking, and his forage uh, representative was there. And he'd been sending his forage samples all winter long. He's still grazing through all kinds of snow in Pennsylvania feeding stockpiled tall fescue, and he'd been all along sending his forage samples in, and all those forage uh, specialists could say, I can't believe what these things are testing. There isn't a first crop hay out there that feeds as well as it's stockpiled or it has a nutri uh, nutritional value that this stockpiled tall fescue has. So how are we going to stockpile tall fescue when we've grazed it all summer long or we've grazed it down to the dirt when it got dry? The only way we're going to 
manage that, or one way we need to consider managing that is to add a worm season grass so that the whole time we want to be stockpiling uh, tall fescue. When do, we, when do you typically start stockpiling tall fescue? Okay, right in here, right about the peak of that warm season. When you start seeing how this fits together, uh, we're, we're trying to work. Everybody kind of takes a look at what Cliff is doing and trying to, you know, we want to try to graze as many days out of the year as we possibly can. It's that simple. So here's where that fits in, is that warm season grass has the potential to fill that summer slump and allow us to begin to stockpile that tall fescue. Okay, we know what happens, you know, in the, in the summertime. These are all of the, the things that can happen or that do happen whenever we start going into that forage slump. You know, we start losing quality. Uh, you know, we start uh, having uh, reduced hay production, increased feed costs, all kinds of these things all begin to take place whenever we start suffering from a dry period. Okay, Th this was kind of an interesting photo. What they were, or an interesting slide, what they were showing here was the folks that were more conservative. They said that the people that were pessimistic about their stocking rates and didn't try to overstock, they were in this category over here. We got a pointer thing? Where's that thing at, Josh? Which one? Red the red button. I don't want to hit the wrong button. Okay. The pessimistic folks who were kind of managing their cow numbers, you know, not trying to get too crazy. You know, again, this is not our area, but they were 24.4 uh, acres per cow versus trying to put 18 acres per cow. Uh, they were stocked less dense. Look at the return on investment. Okay, so managing for the drier weather, uh, they actually, and Clint has run these numbers, you know, everybody thinks you've got to have more cows to make more money. That's not what this is showing. That is not what that's showing. Okay, and, and these acres per cow might be different up here, but it's going to, it doesn't make any difference where you're at. Those are going to begin to hold, hold true. Okay. I don't know what all kind of bells and whistles they put into this presentation, so I'll be surprised too. They did a survey and they were asking folks, you know, what the interest level would be on uh, learning more about these uh, warm season grasses, and they found that, you know, most folks were interested in, uh, somewhat to very interested in this, and that's why we decided to present this. Okay, how can they help improve our forage production? Uh, again, these are uh, what the, a, a dry period, I guess this was in, in August, and this was, uh, I believe, warm season grasses on this side and other tall fescue. So you can see these were neighboring properties managed with different grasses, uh, and you can see that even during the, the, the very uh, heat of the drought, the one on this side had the warm season grasses and they had stuff to graze during that period in time. And that's what it looked like uh, later. You do manage these things different. Again, the heights, and I'm not going to get into all the particulars of how you manage these. I'm just going to tell you that I did it all wrong. I was under the assumption that I managed, I was trying to graze from 18 inches down to no, I knew you didn't want to go more than graze tighter than six inches because of where the growth nodes come out on the uh, warm season grasses. So I was grazing from, I was trying to get in there at 18 inches and graze down to six. It's completely wrong. You want to graze it like 30 inches down to 18. You're grazing leaf and you get out of there. Okay, there were lots of different ways to graze that, but that just shows you during the heat of the drought over the course of a month uh, what the regrowth was like on uh, those warm season grasses. These things root very deeply. You know, they, they run a root where a tall fescue might be 12 to 24 inches, these things root from 8 feet to 12 feet deep. They're, very, they're a very deep-rooted plant, so they have the potential to not only reach a lot of moisture, but they're getting down to where a lot of fertility is at also. There's a lot of fertility in our soils. There is a whale of a lot of fertility in the soils, and I really think that if we begin to focus our attention on plant diversity, rooting depth, uh, soil biology, all of these things, a lot of the things that we are trying to accomplish with fertilizer and all these other things, if we get the soils right, we can get a whale of a lot of other things right, and we will have more grass than we know what to do with. I thought that was extremely interesting. That was in New Mexico during the Dust Bowl. It was one remaining uh, piece of big blue stem that was out in the middle of that prairie.
that had survived the plow. And look at how much soil that that plant, those things have been there for thousands of years. So these plants are, they're really amazing. We totally overlooked them. Uh, but this was very interesting. You know, we all think we're getting lots of yield. They were showing some yield data, actual pasture measured yield data. Uh, if you look at our tall fescue, across the board, they average three ton to the acre. You take a look at some of these warm season grasses, just take switchgrass. I want you to stay focused on switchgrass because it's something that I know we can work with you to accomplish. And I think, I think that the, the information that I received at this training uh, would indicate also that it's probably the one that we need to consider. But 5.3 ton to the acre average. This Kentucky 31 tall fescue, that was with the addition of 180 units of nitrogen. Now they did add 60 units of nitrogen to these warm season grasses, but what they're basically saying is that was completely unnecessary. Uh, that these things really don't respond that well to fertilizer, they'll do fine on their own. Uh, so you've got the ability, I mean, what's that 180 units of N gonna cost you on top of everything else? And you've almost doubled your production on switchgrass, but we're not going through these things a bunch of times. It's one to two harvests a year. So, again, it's a different mentality than what we're doing with our cool season grasses. We're, we might rotate through these pastures two, three, four, or five times. So we're going to change our management strategy a little bit. Okay. Another interesting thing here. Now, they were, they were looking at the average daily gain. And switchgrass was a little bit lower, okay, on the average daily gain. But look at the pounds per acre over the course of the of the grazing season. Look at how look at the the pound per acre gain on switchgrass versus some of the other warm season grasses. Still, the switchgrass continues to float to the top. Uh, this was a stand of 21 year old switchgrass. Uh, again, no fertilizer, no spray rotational grazing. They did burn every one to three years. Now there may be some things that we'd have to look at if you're going to consider that. I have burned. If you've ever, I'm here to tell you, if you ever had a stand of this, do not do that haphazardly. You need to. <laughs> I did that once. <laughs> and I'll just tell you a story. We had, a, had about a one acre piece out in front of the house. That was back before we had trees and everything all around the house. And there was, there was a good 100 foot of buffer, a green yard between uh, the edge of that pasture and the south side of my house. And, and we had been trimming trees along the driveway, and I had a big pile of brush out there. And I thought to myself, I'm just going to burn. And it was right in the middle of this, like, six foot high switchgrass from last uh, fall. It was, it was brown. It, you know, it was dead. And I thought, well, I'll just burn that brush pile. I don't know. It might catch on fire. Holy smokes, <laughs> I lit that thing, <laughs> and it took, I mean, it, it was unreal. Those flames were like 30, 40, 50 feet in the air. I'm not kidding you. We had neighbors driving around, and we, we lived back a long lane, and neighbors were driving by to see what was on fire. And, uh, you know, by the time my wife got to the house and called the fire department and said, you know, everything's under control, uh, it was all over and done with. It was quick, but a prairie fire... Uh, <laughs> Prairie fire is impressive. Uh, so, at any rate, fire may be a tool, but you know, I think we'd probably be better served if we were going to trample and graze and do some things that way that we want to get that carbon in the soil. I mean, ultimately, our goal as grazers is to get carbon into the soil, not into the atmosphere. Okay. So, but that may be something that we need to consider. Uh, the switchgrass, I took a look at the cost per pound of gain. I thought that was impressive where, you know, these other uh, warm season grasses, if you look at switchgrass, they were looking just a little over 30 cents uh, per pound of gain on the, it was for heifers that they were grazing, evidently. So I thought, you know, that was, that was a fairly low cost of, per gain. Uh, this was dealing with the days that they were on there. Although, you know, some of the data early on, they were grazing stuff that was much too mature. They were saying, that, you know, they, they, they're also learning when is the most uh, opportune time to graze. A lot of the data that came out over switchgrass, some of these other warm season was showing it was very 
uh, low nutritional value. There were some things that, uh, you know, that, that they mismanaged and did differently. And as they began to learn how to properly graze these things and manage these things, the gains and some of these things uh, were a little bit more favorable. And if I missed something, Bruce or Bev, you know, feel free to point something out. There was a lot of information that day. And, and I was trying to take it all in. Uh, but again, here was our, our gain per pound, our gain per acre, and that, that corresponds to some of that other data. Oops, which one did I just hit? I just did the same thing. Bottom right. Bottom right. Okay, whoops, that's an easy one to hit. Okay, the net returns. This shows some of the net returns per acre. Again, switchgrass. Every, everything that you keep going through switchgrass keeps floating to the top there is, is something that really looks like it has potential. Uh, again, complementing, we've already talked about this, uh, complementing our cool season grasses. You know, the big, big opportunity that I see here is really uh, the opportunity to do some stockpiling, uh, maybe to get away from some of this fescue problems that we have and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I, I really think this has the opportunity to complement a lot of what we're doing. Any of us can grow tall fescue. I mean, we know we can grow that, so, huh? Okay, maybe we don't want to get rid of it, you know? Maybe we don't want to, you know, that's another thing is we, you don't want to mix this with it. And that's one thing that I learned. I have always tried uh, to manage a cool season, warm season grass mix on my farm. Well, I was trying, and I thought, well, you know, this is close enough. And, and I, I meant to put pictures of what I have. What I'm going to end up doing on mine is going through, and I'm not a big proponent of sprays and all that, but they said two quarts of the acre roundup, like right here at the end of March, first part of April, and burn off and kill all the cool season grasses. The warm seasons haven't started to grow yet. And I'll show you some data. You only need one plant per square foot, so you don't need these things to be thick like sod. Okay, but they likened managing cool season and warm season grasses together like trying to hold a big beach ball underwater. You just can't, you know, it's just flipping one way or the other. It's very difficult to manage. You want to try to manage it as a pure stand. And they did not, they didn't mix the warm season grasses together. They weren't trying to manage the growth curves on Indian grass and big blue stem were different than switchgrass, were different than the uh, eastern gamma grass. So, Again, switchgrass is fairly easy to establish, but you don't want to try to manage it as a cool season, warm season mix. It hasn't really worked well for me. I think I can do better. I'm going to, I'm going to do some testing and try to do some of this. So we'll probably have a pasture walk out there at some point here in the next year or two just to kind of show you folks how this works if you're interested in it. I know where I've had it along the fence rows. I've got, it's really thick. And where I've managed, you know, we have knocked it back, but we haven't killed it. It's been out there for... Jeez, probably 20 years. I don't know. Bart, Bart helped me seed one of those. How long has that been? He was standing on the back trying to get, if you saw that big blue stem, we tried to do some blue stem in Indian grass. It's real fluffy. We were trying to run it through a spinner spreader, and I had Bart on the back trying to jam this thing down in there with a broomstick. You can't see. Yeah. Huh? That was about 2000. Yeah, so there we go, you know, 18 years ago. And that field never did take off. You know, the switchgrass has, but that one never did really. It's out there, but it's nothing to be impressed with. Okay. And, you know, these, these were some of the excuses that people have, uh, have talked about here. You know, too difficult to, to establish, too difficult to manage, too much overlap with cool season, too short a grazing season. These were all the excuses people used for why you couldn't do that. But I'm here to say I don't think they're that difficult to establish. And if we really put our thought process into how to manage those, I think there's some real potential there. And they're basically saying that if you want to graze when the, when the warm season grasses are ready to graze, you need to be grazing them. Pass over your cool seasons and get to your warm seasons and graze those when they're ready to be grazed and let those cool seasons, you know, pass them by and come back to them later. Kevin? Yeah. How do they do in uh, your wetter type soils? Eastern gamma grass would do real good. I don't know about switch. I would have to research some of that. I can see in wetter soils where you wouldn't want to be in there in the spring. Right. But the dry soil yeah. white. Yeah, the eastern gamma grass I think would have some potential. And I'm not saying don't use eastern gamma grass. Eastern gamma grass is a weird bird. It's a big seed. I don't even have any of that. It looks like a spaceship. You'd plant it like with a corn planter, I think. Yeah, it's a big thing. It's it's weird. 
but it is possible. Uh, Greg Johnson had some just over the hill, and I know Tom Bauer has used some of it. There are some fields around if we wanted to look at it. There are some that I know of that are around, and I know Greg's was in wet soil, and that wouldn't be very far from you, really. And the people that can speak up there, they had it right next to the waterway. Mm -hmm. and they seeded it in what was a buffer. Yeah. And it flooded. Yeah. And yeah. They said it was good. Yeah. Was yeah. Eastern Gamma Grass, may, it may be another one that you want to look at. Okay. Uh, these are just some of the challenges, and the switchgrass seed really isn't that small. You, you can see it there, and they can, you can get it. I think it's kind of they take some of that hole off, and it's more like a, I think it's more like Timothy. It, it's, it's not that small and not that difficult to seed. Does germinate fairly slow? It's going to put down a root first, and we've got to control the weed pressure. I know that. There are some strategies to, to using some herbicides. I'm not going to, they're going to be in here. I'm not going to go into great detail with it. If we have some interest in it, we'll get some more detail from the Extension Office and some other publications so we know how to do it correctly. Uh, but you want, you know, I know one thing they want to do is, uh, is some weed control in the fall. This is not going to be anything we're going to do this year, I don't think. This is going to be something we're going to need to have in the back of our minds for next year because you're going to do some control on that. Uh, <clears throat> you're going to do some weed control in the fall of this year, looking to do, do seeding. Uh, next spring and then do some control after that seeding becomes established. And I'll just run through these here quickly. Uh, I know they can do some clipping and some other things to try to get these under control. Uh, there's a whole list of a bunch of things that I'm not really all that familiar with, so I don't want to get into all of the different chemicals. I am not a, I'm not a herbicide specialist, but Plateau is one that I've, I've heard of. But again, if we're going to get into this, we're going to want to make sure that we get a proper prescription to do that and make sure we're doing things correctly. Uh, rainfall, I think rainfall probably in the south is a bigger problem maybe than it is here. Uh, but they want, uh, these were two different pictures taken, uh, two different fields. And one got rain, one didn't. You can see the one that did. You can see how it came along. Uh, again, we want to make sure that... Uh, if we do some of these seedings, we don't want to seed too deep. I mean, we make that mistake with a lot of our uh, alfalfa and clovers and things like that. We just seed these things too darn deep, we, you know, and then we wonder why we had a failure. Uh, but we want to make sure that our depth is correct, our seed to soil contact is right, and they stressed again, we don't want to have a bunch of thatch there if we seed into it. We need that good soil to seed contact. Okay, these things are seeded at a different time. I don't think this, these dates, uh, correspond exactly with our region uh, so we want to take a look at that and make sure that we are, we're hitting that uh, planting and soil temperature just right we see these things when soil temperature is above 65 degrees so I'd have to look into exactly when that is uh, I'm going to say that's probably going to be in what's that what's that probably a month later. yeah I'm, I'm, that's what I was thinking about a month later than what this says so uh, seeding costs are not ridiculous. Again, with switchgrass, they're looking around $48 an acre. So we're not talking about something that's going to break the bank here. Some of these other seeds, and you get into some of these prairie mixes, they can be pretty pricey to get your hands on some of that seed. But switchgrass is not. Okay. Uh, but the, again, the plant populations that have to be there, they're talking about, uh, you know, that, that one doesn't look like much, but there's what it looked like. It, it basically, one plant per square foot will get you where you need to be, and you're looking at uh, potentially grazing the second year. You're not going to plant this and graze it in the first year. So you have to have an area where you're going to uh, realize that you're going to hold back and it'll be grazed in the second year if we can get things really established. But at any rate, that is the basic information that I have on that. I think it's something that we need to look at. Uh, I can entertain some questions but I may or may not have all the answers at this point in time, but I just wanted to throw it out there because I think it's something that we need to consider. So, all right. But for the first, uh, for first year, you don't graze it, so how, how do you manage that, Kevin? It's possible you might clip it. I mean, you're going to have to evaluate the stand. There may be some broad leaves that come in. So that's where, you know, I think they were showing you may have to come in with a second herbicide application. You may be able to clip it and control it. Uh, you gotta, it's going to take some more detailed stand evaluation. 
in natural reason, the Division of Wildlife used to do these plots, used to give this seed out, and so that's how I got interested in it. They had free seed at the time, but they would help kind of evaluate whether it was a successful stand or not and, and help you make some decisions that way. So it's going to take some guidance. Yeah, they mentioned the jack there, you know, would, would you build a plant through, you know, Spray and or not? Are you going to be Probably we're going to want to evaluate how thick that is, and that's going to, you know, field to field, that is different. So that's where some of that, if you spray in the fall, if you've got good biological activity in your soil and you kill it, you know, a lot of that will break down or melt down over the course of the winter. I would think that your biology would consume a lot of that fodder and get rid of some of that, will consume that. So that's what you're not, you're not going to want to spray that in spring and then try to plant. They want to get that. Well, that's the way they made it sound. They'll spray it and wait a couple of weeks. And then well, no, it's sprayed in the fall. Yeah. 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 It may not have been clear on that, but it was a fall. It was definitely a fall spray to get your initial weed control under, get your initial weeds under control and maybe another spring application of herbicide to really get the rest of it knocked down, do your seeding, and then evaluate. So. Same uh, soil fertility as, uh, as grasses. Yeah, or even worse. Don't I would say with this, we don't add fertility before we do this. Definitely no nitrogen. Definitely no nitrogen. No manure, no nitrogen. You do not want to trigger pH. Will be fine. Yeah, you don't need to worry about these high levels of pH. They do fine in lower pH, lower pH soils. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's another one of the beauties of these things. Is that it doesn't take a lot of fertility to get some serious production. So. We talked about um, wet soils, but what about soils that flood in spring and fall sometimes, and sometimes even in the summertime? Will it, will it take that and come out of that? I believe it would, but I'd want to, you know, again, I'd want to go with that question and do a little bit more research just to make sure. Okay. Yeah, I don't want you to invest in that and find out that I, I I can, but I can look at our seeding tables, and it should tell you whether or not, it'll, you know, what the tolerance is for, you know, wet feet. But we can look that up. I don't know right off the top of my head. Those kind of spots, they're hard to get on to early in the year. Sure. You know, and it'd be great to be on there in mm -hmm. July and August. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of forages that we just haven't considered yet. And this, if you can get this established and have that indefinitely, that'd be beautiful. They don't really close in, and that's one of the things that they were looking at. Was we the initial program that that uh, they held for the the uh, NRCS folks was on a Thursday, and they were talking about what's good for the the bird is good for the herd. And what we do with our CRP ground is try to break that up. We don't want a, a dense sod that the birds can't get through. These things aren't designed. They they don't grow like a cool season grass where they're a sod forming grass they're a bunch grass so there is going to be some open soil between them some open areas between them so they don't you know my switchgrass there, there's room between it you want to allow it to be able to fill out and express itself in a big clump but there will be space between the plants so weed management control is going to be a yearly thing then yeah? i don't think so it's going to shade it out it's, going to shade it out. it's dense it's dense, but there's space underneath there. It's still capturing solar energy. There's plenty. I mean, when you actually look at it, I mean, you can see that picture right there, how much you see there. But if you actually get down underneath all that, this stuff grows tall. But you're managing more of the leaf. You don't want to, you know, and eventually you will pull out of it in the fall and leave it go to seed. You know, you don't want to keep that chewed down. You're going to be through it maybe twice. So... So with all that bare soil, you definitely want to graze it when it's on the dry side. Well, yeah, you're you're probably going to be. I mean, you're going to be in there in, you know, end of June, July, August, and then probably not back in there again. Yeah. And you, like I said, you don't want that everywhere. But. Steep ground and really control. Is there anything to think about that? I've, I've had some dolly yeah, yeah. I, I would say that's going to be something you're going to want to look at, you know, whether or not whether or not to do it. 
Well, you, I would say if you're going to do it, maybe make sure you plan on the contour and try to. It'd be something to be concerned about and to evaluate, and maybe not make your strip too wide. You know, I don't know how wide your paddocks or your field would be, but it'd be something to consider. How does it work in a hay production situation? They do make hay off of it, but it doesn't. The problem is it doesn't make super high quality hay. Okay. And you have to mow it high. You got to mow it high. I mean, can you can you set your? I can't set a mower that high. I mean, you're looking at what they say. 12 inches? Can you set your disc mower to mow 12 inches high? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, they do, and they do, and in, in the western part of the country, make hay off of it. But yeah, they they were looking at, it, they are looking at it for a fuel source for being able to burn it. I mean, they bale and switch grass, and they look. They have for years looked at it for a fuel source for power. So, at any rate, any other questions? What uh, for fertility that you need to apply the, the warm season grass versus the cool season grass? Very little fertility. And it's getting its nutrients because it's growing so many more tons per acre. It's pulling its nutrients out the soil. Yeah. Deep, 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 deep. I mean, it, eight to twelve feet deep. Oh, eight to twelve feet, feet. No, no. Now I have not dug mine up to see if they actually go that deep. <laughs> but they're deep, very deep. So, field tile could be a problem. Eh, I don't know that. I mean, it might be, but I don't know that many of us have that many field tile that we got to worry about. Yeah. Now they're reaching moisture. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, it, I suppose it's possible. But, at any rate, we can talk more about it later. I want to announce uh, we, we've got the flyers back there for the April, April <laughs> pasture walk. Uh, Kurt Sawinski is here. Kurt, you want to raise your hand? Uh, we are going to be, Kurt's graciously agreed to have us out. Kurt has a farm that he just acquired. When did you buy that? Last fall? Yeah. It's last fall. There's no cattle on it yet, but we've got some interesting things we want to look at on that farm. Uh, we want to talk about some of these uh, fertility issues, some forage ID. He's got a spring development that nobody wants to reach their hands into. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Should I tell a story? Sure. Yeah. So I'm out there with Joe. Joe Maley was here. And, Kurt had us out to look at this spring tank, and, and it was a typical spring tank. It was making water, but it's kind of tilted. You'll see it when we get out there, but it's kind of murky. You know, you don't know what's lurking in there. But, you know, I was interested in how the thing was functioning. I didn't know what Joe was thinking about. So I got a big stick, and I was reaching down in there, and I felt what I thought was the overflow pipe. So I got a hold of it, but it was under all this murk. I reached it up there. I told Joe, I said, reach down in there and get that. <laughs> he kind of he kind of looked at me, and I said, "Reach down in there and get that." He said, "I ain't reaching in there." <laughs> Kurt looks. He says, "He doesn't trust you at all, does he?" <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so, anyway, we're going to take a look at that spring development, and how, you know, take a look at some of the issues. I know we run into these a lot where we run into these spring tanks. Uh, how we might renovate that, and some ideas on how it how it was originally designed, how we would go about evaluating its potential to be renovated. And then there's a lot of a lot of trees and a lot of brush on the farm, and taking a look at maybe some silver pasture ideas, some brush control, brush management, how to you know how to kind of reclaim this farm. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit different uh, type of a of an operation that we'll be on in April. But let's hope the weather's good. Uh, there are no barns out there, so bring a raincoat, uh, and hope we don't have a tornado. <laughs> Bernie. I suppose you could, but I wouldn't. I mean, if I had this, you're looking at this for a lifetime. So if you consider doing this, look at it for a lifetime, because it has, it really has the potential to be there for a lifetime, yeah. for the entire life of your farm. So. What's that? Versus five is 
That's a big difference. It's it's a huge difference, and and you know we everything we do in our pastures, we want that. It's like the cover crops. We want that diversity. We need that diversity in our soils. If you look at the rooting depth and the rooting spread and all the all the the uh, microbiology associated with each and every individual species that we have the potential to grow, that's what we're trying to get to flourish. We need diversity in the mix. The good Lord didn't design not one monoculture out there. Look around you. It's not rocket science. You will not find in the natural environment a monoculture anywhere. It doesn't exist except in our corn rows and our soybean rows and everywhere else. Why do we, you know, we have the ability to add this diversity. So, one, one plant, just one species of plant and the whole thing. You know, you don't see that in our woodlots. Look around. You got tall growing trees, you got shrubs, you got brambles, you've got all this diversity, all these, you know, flowers, all this stuff. Let's look at it. We want to manage our pastures the same way. We had the uh, prairie grasses before we had the cattle. Yep. And we killed them. We had the buffalo we had before we had the cattle. Yeah. We killed them. Doggone, you guys brought those cattle in here and ran my buffalo out of town. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Generally, generally that's true. There, there's a few patches of prairie, a few, uh, an awful lot of that. You know, as the Native Americans moved through, they opened up woodlands to for agricultural purposes, and some of these grasses and things followed that pattern. So. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Anybody else have anything for the good of the order? Kendall, you good? Uh, Bruce, is Bruce, okay. Okay, as we know, this is our last meeting here. So we look forward to seeing everybody out on the farm. We thank you for having us. We thank everybody that sponsors us. we got to remember to go to our sponsors and support them because they're supporting us. And on that note, Jefferson Landmark is having an open house March 30th and 31. They've got some specials. I don't have any of them, but uh, again, we need to support them. Even though Kevin doesn't want to make hay, some of us still do, John. <laughs> <laughs> we thank our speakers. Uh, the food in the program tonight was Harrison and Jefferson County, SWCD. We want to thank them because they fed us well. And I want to thank everybody who sticks around and helps clean up this room and leaves it the way it's supposed to be when we're done. So thank you all. We'll see you in a month out on a pasture. <laughs>